morning, everyone. <laughs> How is everyone doing? I hope are uh, not too sleepy. <laughs> because we have a very interesting session today on NLP. And I'm very excited to introduce our, our speaker for today, Lee Yang. And uh, she is currently uh, an assistant professor at uh, Stanford University. She's uh, part of the NLP groups there. And she's been doing research on NLP, uh, especially in the human aspects of NLP, which I think we'll get into that today. So just to give you guys a little bit of a background, she, uh, she got her PhD from CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. And then very impressively went straight to become a professor afterwards. She don't need postdoc or anything at Georgia Tech. And that's where we uh, have a chance to collaborate. And eventually she becomes my PhD thesis advisor uh, committee, actually. So thanks again for that. And uh, afterwards, she, uh, she spent several years at Georgia Tech. And then uh, she. Uh, start a professor position at uh, Stanford University, which is where she is affiliated with currently. So, uh, just to give some ideas about her, she she got so many awards that I have to have a a note here because I don't remember all of that and I won't be able to go through all of it. So, just to name a few, she got the ACL Outstanding Paper. She got an NSF Career Award, Microsoft Research Faculty Fellow, Samsung AI Researcher of the Year, Intel Rising Star Award. She also uh, has the Outstanding Junior Faculty Award while she was at Georgia Tech. Uh, she's in Forbes 30 under 30s in science, IEEE AI tend to watch. I mean, we could go on forever, but I will just stop here. And so yeah, I think we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to uh, learn from an expert like her. So without further ado, let's uh, start the session. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you, Paraso, for the very nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, I'm Dee. Um, today, I'm going to talk about an introduction to natural language processing in the age of large language models. Before I get started, I want to just know, like, who are you? Like, how many of you are undergrads? Only two. Okay. How many of you are master students, PhDs? Okay. That's good. How many of you are high school students? Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, okay, so um, welcome to this session. Uh, I was told that uh, I should start with a very high level overview of what is large, what is natural language processing and then move into large language models. Um, since it's a short session, we are going to have like two parts this morning. And I know I'm probably not going to cover everything in detail, but there are a few courses and tutorials I did in the past. So if you are into a more in-depth version of natural language processing or even human-centered NLP, you can go to those two links where you can get all the slides and homework, et cetera. There are also two tutorials I did uh, in the last two years. Uh, the first one is called uh, Learning with Limited Data. You can get access to the content uh, through this link. And also an uh, earlier tutorial this year called uh, Summarizing Conversation at a Scale. So all of those are also public. Um, today, I want to, especially in the first part, I want to cover two aspects to get you familiar with what is natural language processing and also some recent approach of how we go from word to vec to transformers to large pertinent language models to reinforcing the learning from human preference. So it will be a lot of content, especially for the per first part. I prepare it for people who don't know NLP so much so if you feel like you already know that, maybe come back after coffee. Um, let's just get started to what is natural language processing. Um, the field actually progressed a lot. If you think about in 1950s to 1970s, actually we communicated with computers through this kind of tape, with instructions. 
and around the 1980s, you can write code to let it perform certain tasks. Today, um, or even a few years ago, you can use Siri. Today, a lot of those are through ChatGPT. Uh, this is something released later last year. Uh, so far, almost everyone in NLP has already been familiar with ChatGPT in terms of its amazing capabilities of how you can actually get uh, uh, prompting and a different type of task solved through this interface. Earlier this year, we also have GPT-4. Um, for many, many te tests or exams where humans um, used to struggle, such as SAT bar exam, which is a law exam in US, as we can see that the human average is marked with this kind of human symbol here. And then GPT-4 performance are actually way better than human, pref human performance for many of those tasks. So that seems to be today. Well, if you look at a lot of the um, machine translation or traditional tasks we have, we have machine translation, which we can do translation from um, Thai language to English or from many other languages to others. Uh, natural language processing has been um, a field where it always uses uh, machine learning or deep learning to try to approach computational linguistic problems. Um, applications, as you see probably before this year, there are machine translation, question answering, dialogue systems, information extraction, summarization, sentiment analysis. And then core technologies, uh, for many of you, probably you heard the language modeling. Uh, in addition to that, we also have part of speech tagging, syn synthetic parsing, named entity recognition, word sense dis disambiguation, semantic role labeling, and many, many others. And many of those probably are solved today with this kind of large language models. Um, again, w when we start to understand the language, I also want to remind you that it's not only just next token prediction. If you think about how human perceive language understanding, uh, from the very top, we have speech. Speech may involve accent, or then we have text, phonetics, phonology, um, morphology, to lexemes, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, discourse. So as we can see, the field actually take a very uh, in-depth approach here, ranging from shallow to deep here, in terms of what we can achieve through language understanding. I'm not going to go into detail in terms of what each of those is, but I want to remind you that language is beyond the tokens. So that's about um, like very traditional linguistic view of natural language processing. Uh, recently, there is also a lot of um, attention towards the human aspect of NLP. So as one of the quotes I put here, the common misconception is that language use has primarily to do with words and what they mean. It doesn't. It has primarily to do with people and what they mean. So uh, in the end of this talk, I will also mention some of the human-centered natural language processing. So now we are going to just take a look at some quick tasks so that when we go to the second part, you won't get surprised of what I mean by natural language inference or other type of terminology here. Probably one of the biggest or the most frequent method you heard is text classification. So this is a natural language understanding task where we are going to assign a label or a class to the entire text. The text here could be a sentence, it could be a paragraph, or it could be a document here. Um, basically, we are going to build a mapping from the input to any kind of classification models through this to an output. This could be a binary label, uh, multiple labels, et cetera. And uh, for a long time, there are different type of methodologies we introduce. So for example, sentiment analysis is a widely used application that almost all, almost all like online uh, websites want to have a component like that. Um, you can actually classify a user's uh, text into, let's say, positive, negative, neutral, or happiness or anger, a lot of emotions. Uh, from a math uh, perspective, something you can do is that, okay, we are going to have a raw text here, such as COVID cases are increasing fast. And then the output is a polarity uh, label. This could be negative or positive attitude. 
Um, for a long time, you can actually utilize in some formulation like what I showed here, a logistic regression, where x is going to be your input and then w is going to be some weight we want to learn. And then uh, you can do this kind of normalization to get the final probability here. Very interestingly, this is also the foundation of many of the simple feed for neural network and then the idea is also used today in most of the neural approach here. The format is also very similar to the softmax. The other type of text classification task you're probably going to see is called a natural language inference. So in this task or in this application, we are going to determine the relation between two sentences. That is whether a given hypothesis is true, false, or undermined, giving a premise. So here we are talking about two sentences and then the relation between them. Um, the relation could take the label of entailment, that is A can entail B. Uh, contradiction, A cannot entail B. Or neutral, there is no relation between the two sentences. This is one of the very fundamental tasks to assess whether NLP systems can understand the inference or relations between two sentences. So, so far, I just give you two tasks that focus on the text level, like which is like sentence level. Um, we can also go into very fine granularity here if you think about a token here. So token classification means that when we have a sentence, we want to give a token to each specific uh, token there. We want to give a label to each specific token. Um, if you have uh, an input here, like my name is Omar and I live in Zurich, um, through a token classification model, we probably want to assign like person to the name Omar and then uh, Zurich with a location tag here. This type of task is also very uh, important in uh, old days where we have to assign, let's say, a POS tag to each individual word to indicate their function. Um, so you can see, okay, this is a verb, this is a noun, this is a, a punctuation, this is an adjective, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of the task in biomedical domain uh, used to deal with named entity recognition. And this is where natural language processing can jump in. So um, in NER, we call it NER, you're basically going to have like different type of tags for each token or for each tag span here. So we will have the beginning, um, the inside and outside. So if someone says, my name is John Smith and I live in Berlin, so John Smith is going to be a named entity here, starting from John, and the Smith is the inside. And then Berlin is going to be a location. So you can imagine that a computer program read this sentence and assign specific tokens or tags to different uh, text span. Parsing, uh, many of you probably also heard about parsing. Parsing used to be a big core NLP task. And then very high level, it tries to analyze the relation between tokens. So for example, maybe a red apple, uh, red is used to modify apple, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of parsing. Um, if you look at the NLP literature, we have synthetic parsing, semantic parsing, dependency parsing, discourse parsing, many, many different types of parsing to tell us the relation be between different sentences. Um, Another task related to token relation is called a co-reference resolution. Co-reference resolution means that we want to find all expressions that refer to the same entity in a text. Uh, so here, if we have something like Michael Jordan played this basketball and he uh, is done right now, like what does he refer to, um, specific names, et cetera. So this is to ensure that uh, NLP systems can understand uh, those different uh, reference and uh, contexts. Um, another quite important and not a solved task by ChatGPT type of models is called open information extraction. Sometimes we call it open IE. So this refers to the extraction of relation tuples. Um, typically, you may have like binary relations in this kind of um, tuplets. For example, if we have something like Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook, then we could represent that information through these tuples here. 
or as you can see from what I showed here, like different examples, um, she born in a small town. Um, if we could extract all the key information, we may have something like she born in town or she born in small town. Uh, for a long time, there was this effort at uh, Carnegie Mellon University called uh, Never Ending Learning, where the key idea is that what if we build an uh, information extraction system to read the web at every moment? Then we could uh, turn everything on the web into a very well-structured information base. Uh, in this way, we may be able to uh, track knowledge, production, uh, and uh, evolution. Semantic parsing and text to code um, also gets very popular today, especially if you think about the large pre-trained language models. We add this kind of code uh, generation to be part of the pre-training process or fine-tuning process where you could uh, ask models to follow instructions in a very fine granularity. So semantic parsing refers to we are going to have a natural language utterance and we are going to convert it into a logical form. This is the basis of many commercial uh, conversational AI systems where if a user has a query like turn off the light, then the system may convert that into an action and then um, get implemented by the uh, physical softwares. Uh, also a lot of robotics applications utilizing semantic parsing as well. Text code is pretty uh, straightforward, so think about what if we ask those type of models just to write a code a snippet based on a natural language input. So far, we talk about sentence uh, and the token. Um, if we look at the relation between those sentences, there are also sentence similarity or next sentence prediction, all sorts of things. Uh, sentence similarity is pretty straightforward. We can determine how similar two texts are. So this could be that if we have two sentences, then um, what would be their similarity? You can take the uh, embedding of each sentence and then do a cosine similarity or other type of similarity calculation. You may be wondering like, okay, this seems very meta task. What would be some sort of applications? Um, even if we just take the sentence similarity as one example, um, think about like search queries in Google or in many other commercial search engines. Uh, once user input a query, uh, this query actually is used to retrieve all existing possible documents in their corpus and then re return a ranked list to users. There are lots of questions involved. How to represent that query? What if user has typos there? What if the user query is too short? Uh, in terms of search, how to make it more efficient? How to get that ranked uh, passage? How to make this process parallel, et cetera? So even for very simple functionalities that involve NLP, there are many, many other adjacent uh, uh, studies or research fields you may want to consider. So that's a very quick overview of traditional NLP task. Um, with that, we are going to move into more about uh, methods and approach. Uh, specifically, I want to cover one line of method. That is how we go from word to vec, Elmo, BERT, to uh, transformers, per training, in-context learning, and uh, RLHF today. So if you have questions, feel free to just raise your hand or we can stop every 10 or 15 minutes. So um, all the story from my perspective actually start from word embedding. Um, I showed you many, many different type of NLP task. In the past, how researchers solve it is that we actually going to build a machine learning systems for specific NLP applications. And we are going to do like feature engineering on top of SVM or CRF or HMM a lot of those models. Um, in 2013-ish, um, um, I think that the concept of neural word embedding is introduced. One of the starting point is called a word to vec. Um, how could we use a vector to represent the meaning of words? Before this, you actually could think about like dictionaries and a lot of other traditional approach. So static word embeddings, there are two kind of fundamental models. Uh, the first one is this kind of uh, contextualized bag of words, and the second is the skip gram. The idea is that if we think about 
uh, tax window. Let's say um, we have a window of five. Um, then we could have WT minus two, WT minus one, WT plus one, WT plus two, to predict what is in the middle of that tax window. So in this case, we are going to use the context to predict this specific target word here. The intuition is that if the word representation is very meaningful and robust, then we can actually infer which word is missing here based on the context. Some of you maybe wonder like, oh, maybe the word WT could take many, many formats. Like if I think about I really blank um, Bangkok, Thailand. So then it could be I really like, I really love, I really hate. A lot of words can go into this. So because many words can go into this um, position, later when you calculate a word similarity, you are able to retrieve similar words with similar meanings. Another very counterintuitive, but a work very well approach is called a skip gram, very uh, opposite to what we have on the left. The idea is that we are going to use the middle word, WT, like, like, love, hate, etc., to predict I really Bangkok, Thailand. So we use the middle word to predict the context. So those are just like the two very early approach in terms of how we do uh, word embedding. If we just use skip gram as a way to go through the underlying mechanisms, what we are doing is that we are actually going to maximize the log likelihood of context word WT minus M, so M here is a window size, uh, to WT minus one, WT plus one, to WT plus M, giving the word WT. That is, we are going to use this single word to predict all their contacts. You can write down the objective, he, objective here as um, we have a set of parameters to optimize. We have WT. We are going to produce WT plus J, and then J is going to be enumeration of that window we have there. And then you can actually uh, enumerate it across all the sentences or all the potential target words that we have. So potentially, we are going to use a sliding window to go through every sentence in the training corpus. Uh, you can take a log of this because it's much easier to operate in the log space compared to in the numerical space. Uh, usually the M here, when people are training word to VAC, is something around a five to 10. To give you a high level sketch of the algorithm, so if we are going to train, let's say, word to VAC for a new language, um, we are going to treat the target word and the neighboring context word as positive examples. We are going to randomly sample other words in the lexicon to get negative samples. Then you can pick whatever methods you like, like a logistic regression to train a classifier to dis distinguish those two cases. And in the end, what we are going to learn is actually this type of W. We do not care about the accuracy of the classifier. We care about the weight we learned through this kind of process. So this is like a very high level approach in terms of how we train this kind of uh, skip and gram models. And then it also has a name called us, um, skip and gram with negative sampling. There are different uh, ways to optimize this objective. Uh, so here I just showed the one approach of doing that. Um, word embedding has been very uh, powerful. Um, when it was introduced since 2013, uh, a lot of researchers has leveraged it to do a lot of um, ablation studies or just studies in general. So you may heard of the story of uh, king plus, um, king minus men equals to queen minus female, et cetera, et cetera. There are also a lot of embedding um, studies around the culture biases and a lot of those biases studies associated with word embeddings. So that's the static word embedding. It only mark the step one of all the stories we see so far in the last uh, several years. Pro and con of static word embedding. From a positive perspective, as you may imagine, you can actually pre-train embeddings on a large corpus, and then you can easily download it and reuse for any downstream task you have. The disadvantage is that 
if a word can have multiple meanings in different contexts, this kind of static word embedding is actually not able to give it to us. If you think about the example of, I went to the river bank yesterday. Bank refers to the places near the river. Versus, I had been to the bank to withdraw some money. Bank means a financial um, bank. So those two cases are very different. But if you use word embeddings, you are going to just get one specific vector there, which is not enough. So the solution is that we need something that's more contextualized. Um, here comes Elmo. Elmo was introduced in 2017, uh, 18, and I think this is the best paper of NACO that year. So in Elmo, what it does is that, okay, we're going to leverage word embeddings, which is the yellow boxes here, and then on top of that, we are going to introduce two layer of LSTM. So this blue box here refers to the representation after one layer of LSTM. And then the green box refers to once you add another direction. Actually, this is bi-directional LSTM here. So in the end, what Elmo does is that they are going to leverage the representation from word embedding, from after one layer of LSTM, from after two layer of LSTM. And then you can just utilize a weighting mechanism there to combine those different uh, representations. It turns out to work very, very well, outperforming all the existing methods at that time in 2017-18. The key insight is that, I guess, why it works. First, you are going to have word embeddings that capture those very low level word information. The blue box here actually covers something more synthetic or middle layer. And then the green boxes here may capture something very high level related to labels, et cetera, et cetera. So Elmo actually demonstrated one of the earlier success of contextualized deep neural network for NLP. Um, Elmo also starts this kind of stories of people naming those models based on all sorts of fancy logos, as you can probably hear, like there was a bird, Bernie, and a lot of models after that. Um, there are lots of popular word embeddings in that time, so I just showed some of those here. Um, this mark the starting of NLP towards something more deep and uh, neural moving forward. Um, a nearest neighbor or a very close term that all of us probably hear multiple times all the time is called the language modeling. This is the basis of many, many uh, large personal models like GPT-3, 4 that we have been talking about today. Uh, going to the very fundamental format of language modeling, the input is that we are going to have a sequence of words which we call context. And then the output is going to be the probability of next word, like W here. In very, very, very earlier stage, if you think about the stage of fit forward neural network, we are going to actually predict this word uh, based on a fit forward neural network, such as I visited a new and then blank. So we wanted to output a York here. If you have all the previous words, W, I, minus N, um, until WI minus one, we are going to predict WI here. So this is going to be the output distribution. This is what we call hidden layer, concatenating the word embedding, words, one hot vectors, etc. There is a key disadvantage here. That is, you need to deal with this kind of context, right? Because um, we need to concatenate the word embeddings and then since like every time we take a four or five, this needs to be learned many, many times. So recurrent neural network was introduced on top of fit for neural network. In recurrent neural networks, you probably hear the cell LSTM, GRU, and many others. In this way, um, actually for every input, like I saw the dog, every step we can actually make a prediction using their output uh, hidden representations. So in a specific LSTM cell, you will see that at every step, there are two outputs, something from the to the top, something to the next stage. Those two usually are the same. And then you can actually just pick this hidden representation like HI here to predict which word will be followed by dog here. 
We also write it into this uh, predicting the word W in the context. And uh, uh, the implementation is that we are going to utilize the softmax, which is a very earlier logistic regression format we saw earlier to predict this uh, word. And then uh, the loss function is going to be this kind of um, negative log likelihood of predicting the word W given the context here. You can sum all the negative log likelihood at each position to serve as a total loss for this kind of uh, modeling. The uh, optimization process involves very standard backpropagation through the network to um, learn to predict next word given previous words at all positions. So this is the earlier version of language modeling through recurrent neural network. I also want to mention a few things here. So if you think about a lot of the NLP task, we actually don't report accuracy. What we do is that instead of reporting accuracy, we do something different. Why? Um, because predicting the next word out of, let's say, 20,000 words is generally impossible. There's no way we can actually report something meaningful. So the accuracy values will be very, very low and does not make sense. So instead, for most the large language models, we actually evaluate those models on the likelihood of the held out data. Um, this is actually defined as perplexity. Uh, basically, for all the data in the test or held out data, we are going to calculate the probability of predicting the next word given the context and enumerated ac across all possible sentences we have. So that's recurrent neural network. We are only until probably step three here until what's fancier later. So if you think about a recurrent neural network, there is no way you can jump back and forth. And in fact, um, in this process, only some information like here is transitioned to the next position. But there may be a very long context here. But then all the information are actually compressed into a hidden representation to next step. So this is going to create an information bottleneck because you may have like 20 words as a context. But no matter whether it's 20 words or two words, all of them are going to be expressed through the same hidden representation here. And this is going to create the information bottleneck. Um, for this type of models, especially if you use it for like machine translation, you will see that as the sentence length increase, this type of recurrent neural network performance drops significantly. So in order to fix this kind of uh, information bottleneck, people introducing the pointing mechanism or we need a more powerful architectures here to think about how to take care of the dependency here. Um, this is where we are going to cover transformers. So uh, transformers actually utilizing attention mechanism to deal with this. But before uh, attention and the transformers, in a long, I guess like a long time ago, we utilizing this pointing mechanism, like pointer um, network to deal with this kind of jumping back and forth um, in NLP. So now we are going to cover transformers. Any questions so far? Are the pointer networks a uh, separate set of networks? Or uh, is it just the attention, the uh, Baudinot attention, I think? Uh, additive attention, uh, is that the pointing you're talking about? Yeah, so here, this is not a separate network. Um, basically, if you think about it in like a recurrent neural network, uh, we need a mechanism to jump in back and forth, right? So you can actually utilize in something like a pointer, like at the decoding stage, could we maintain a mechanism to jump into some of the earlier positions. So one way of implementing that could be like you can use attention or cross attention to simulate um, different importance of words in the input to the words that you are going to decode. 
So that's, you can call it like a pointing mechanism. This is not a separate network, but just like a high level mechanism of how you're jumping back and forth before the self attention, the money had attention in transformers. Okay, I think we can move forward because we have a lot of content. Um, so I will provide a very quick overview of transformers. This is something very important today. And if you want to understand, uh, there are different views. Uh, one view is that in order to do neural networks and understand a lot of the large language models, you need to understand transformers. And sometimes when you go for industry job interview, people may ask you the details of transformers. That's view one. View two is that even if you understand the details, it's not of any use to you, for you to understand the large language models. So you can take whatever view you like here. I'm going to just talk about this kind of uh, attention and the transformers, since it's a very clever idea. Um, you can use attention to allow like very flexible access to memories or to the input. And basically what attention does is to mimic how human view um, specific words. When we look at a text from left to right, uh, some words may be very important. If I see something like, I really like Bangkok, you probably put attention to like and Bangkok. You probably are not going to put a lot of attention towards very, right? Uh, so attention treats each word's representation as a query to access and incorporate information from a set of values. Um, instead of attention from the decoder to the encoder in the machine translation or a lot of other setup, transformer, this block we are going to talk about, actually operates attention within a single sentence. So what does that mean? You can think about attention as a soft averaging lookup table. Um, on the left, if we think about a lookup table, which is that we have a table of keys that map to values, and then we have a query. That's something we are curious about. We are going to use the query to match one of those keys, and then we are going to get the value. Right? So this is a process if you just think about a standard lookup table. In attention, what we do is that instead of getting a specific row from this lookup table, we are going to use the query to match all the keys in a soft fashion. That is, we are going to assign a weight between zero to one for each row. And then in the end, the weighted sum is going to be what we have as values. So this is a very high level a uh, comparison of thinking about attention as averaging lookup table. Um, when it comes to transformers, before I talk about the multi-headed attention, uh, the first uh, building block is called uh, self-attention. In self-attention, there are three things you need to keep in mind. There are keys, queries, and the values, and there are a specific process of how we uh, deal with them. So the step one is usually to transform each word embedding with uh, some weight matrix that we need to learn. So here you, we may have QI, KI, VI, and then XI is the input. So as you can see uh, here. And then you can uh, compute the pairwise similarities between keys and the queries and normalize them with softmax. Um, the last step is that you are going to calculate output for each word as weighted sum of values. So this is the process of calculating self-attention. We are not going to go deep into this because there are many steps ahead, but you should definitely take some time to reflect on how this is calculated. Self-attention is one small building block. In order for us to come to the transformers, there are many, many barriers that we need to think about. The first one is that right now we don't have an uh, order um, taken into account. That is, we just deal with words, right? But if you think about the language, I really like Bangkok. There is an order in here, not a Bangkok really like me, right? So we need to think about the ordering of language. To do this, you can add a position representations to the inputs. This is when you look at the transformer architectures in addition to embedding why we always have this kind of position embedding here. 
I want to mention that the position embedding, the importance of position embedding is actually very interesting. There are more and more recent studies in terms of whether we need uh, precision embeddings. There is also something called uh, uh, nonlinearity. So people may argue that one of the reasons why neural network works is because it allows a lot of nonlinearity there. So, so far in the calculation process, there isn't a much nonlinearity. So instead of um, all the previous ones, we are going to just apply the same fit for the neural network to each self-attention output. So in this way, we guarantee non-linearity. The third one is that sometimes when we are dealing with machine translation or language modeling, we do not want to look into the future. Since for transformers, it's all the operations are within the same sentence. We do not want to look at the future. We only want to jump in back. Otherwise, this is a data leakage or a ground truth leakage here. To deal with this, we are going to introduce a mask mechanism to mask out the futures by artificially setting those attention weights to their zero. So that's like the building block. But the reality is that what if we want to look at multiple places in the sentence at once? And uh, this is what we call multi-headed attention. So we are going to define multiple attention head through multiple QKV matrices. And then each attention head will perform attention separately. And then the output of all the heads will be combined. So if you look at the left, this is how we calculate self-attention earlier stage. So we have Q, we have key, we have V, and then how we get to the final output here. This is self-attention. In multi-headed attention, we are just going to copy each of them multiple times. So here we show three sets of uh, attention scores. And then uh, we are just going to calculate them separately. At this stage, as you can see, this is a difference. Previously, we only have one output. Right now, we have three, and we are going to introduce a P operation here so that we can have a way to combine them into the final output. So sometimes in this process, this P operation um, deal with like collapse those head attentions by reshaping them into something different. So basically this is going to be a um, design choice. Sometimes can be arbitrary, sometimes can be brutal false. So that's like the transformer decoder. Um, remember that now we replace self-attention with multi-headed self-attention. And then uh, there are also several tricks here. Uh, for people who are familiar with computer vision, there are these residual connections uh, we are going to introduce into this process. We are also going to do layer normalization. So in most the transformer diagrams, you'll see uh, those two are often write, written together as add and a norm here. The transformer encoder, so we talk about the transformer decoder. In the encoder, um, transformer decoder constrained to like n directional text since it's mainly for language modeling. But if we want a bi directional context, like in a bi directional RNN for machine translation or generation, then we probably want an encoder here. Uh, encoder and the decoder are almost the same. The only difference is that we do not need to have masking in the self attention layer for encoder. Um, if you put those two together, we have the transformer encoder decoder here. So for most sequence to sequence neural network or format, we are going to use this kind of transformer encoder decoder. Um, as I mentioned, those two are almost the same, except in encoder, there is no um, masking mechanism. However, we need to combine them in a way that's very strategic. So the only change we are going to make to transformer decoder is that we are going to modify it to perform cross attention to the output of the encoder. So this is a key component of connecting those two together. So in this cross attention fashion, the key and the values are drawn from the encoder side, like think about it as a memory. And then the queries are drawn from the decoder. That is, when we are going to decode something, we are going to look into the input to see how they can inform the decoding at the current stage. So it's a lot of uh, details here. Um, let's just take it back. So if you take everything together, uh, this is 
uh, going to be just like a specific block. You probably see similar architectures in all the blog posts and other other parts. So each of the uh, either the green or the pink box here is a transformer with all the details we just go through. You can um, stacking it together. You can do 12 layer of transformer. You can do 24 layer of transformer. You can do 76, et cetera, et cetera. Um, taking all of those together, this is like what we view as transformers today. Uh, you can do multiple decoders, multiple encoders, and if you view just utilizing GPT-2 model as one case study, the difference between medium, large, and extra large, uh, one of the key component is how many layers you stack them together. So um, basically, this gives the model, I mean, more layers give the model more chance to learn more information. So that's the transformer block. We will come back to uh, GPT-3 and the RLHF soon. But the introduction of transformers, this is also utilized by BERT, actually start this modern NLP paradigm, pre-training plus fine-tuning paradigm. So um, until last year, this paradigm was very popular. So the step one is usually what we call pre-training, because we are going to train transformer-like models with different layers on very large data sets. This could be all books, all the inter entire uh, internet web. This step, usually we do next token prediction or mask language model or other kind of operations. So we can learn general structure and the meaning of text, um, similar to word embedding. So this is how we draw back to step one of word embedding. So knowledge is going to be reflected by the model parameters. The second stage is what we call fine tuning. So once we have a model, let's say Bert or Roberta or Bart, all sorts of things, then we can fine tune those models on a smaller task specific data sets, such as sentiment analysis or machine translation. This step will learn information specific to a task on top of pre-training. Um, there will be this kind of uh, paradigms. I want to go deep into what we mean by pre-training here, since this is the basis of how people train large language models. There are three types of pre-trained models. Um, if you, even if you just look at the current mainstream that we have so far, um, each of those pre-training par, uh, paradigm actually has different training objectives. So the left one is that we may have decoder-only large language models. And those type of models usually utilize next word prediction. The second type is encoder-only models, such as mask language modeling. So the key objective is to fit in, in the blank. The third one is encoder-decoder type of architectures. So the objective is to do corrupted text reconstruction. So we are going to go deep into three, each of those. So remember, there are three kind of pre-trained model paradigm. The first one is left to write large language models, uh, decoder only. So the key is to do next word prediction, the standard language modeling. People may be curious, like why decoder only models? Well, there are lots of recent work, either theoretical or empirical from big companies uh, showing like, okay, what if we uh, add encoder or why decoder only works? Overall, the goal of those decoder type of models is that we want to generate a text one token at a time, conditioned on the previous tokens in the sequence. So we only need to read a part of the text from a left to right fashion. So this is one of those um, architecture. So example of success may involve GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, um, I want to add the GPT-4, but we don't know the architecture here. Uh, those type of tasks are very suited or very appropriate for natural language generation tasks. So if you think about the prompting as one such mechanism, this is like generation. So we want to do generation from left to right. 
Um, this kind of models, sometimes people also call it a causal language modeling or the output depending on the past and the present input, but not the future ones. Um, you probably also hear about people talking about it as autoregressive modeling. So the previous outputs become input to the future outputs here. So this is the left to right language model um, decoder only. Um, the GPT family, as I mentioned, are the most popular successful decoder only models. So this is a GPT-2 in action. Hopefully it works. Uh, um, the second uh, pre-trained model is called a mask language model. So this is encoder only. Um, the successful example is BERT and Roberta. So why encoder only? Well, the idea here is that for this kind of filling in the blank, we want to understand the input text. That is, encode an uh, input sequence into a fixed lens vector representation. This kind of architecture is best for natural language understanding task, but not a good for generation task. That's probably why like, you can use BERT for natural language inference classification, but not use BERT for generation task. Um, this is one of the process of how you utilize this kind of BERT. So in the training of BERT, um, you randomly mask 15% of the tokens and then use the context to predict what's missing there and then use this to train together with the next sentence prediction objective. Um, this is still encoder only models. Um, the last one is called encoder decoder models. So a lot of Google's uh, pre-trained models are of this kind of encoder decoder paradigm. So in this fashion, we are going to have bi-directional attention on X and also um, uni one direction on Y. And uh, sometimes we call it a corrupted text construction. So why do we need uh, this kind of encoder and a decoder architecture? Um, because we want to have both encoding or understanding the input and also decoding and generating context. So think about the text to text transfer. Successful example architectures include a BART from Facebook called uh, BART, recover sentences, and also T5, recover spans. This is best for both natural language understanding and natural language generation. If you think about uh, this kind of a T5 uh, models, every task use text as input to the model and then use the generated text as output. This will allow us to use the same model, same loss functions, and the same hyperparameters across all diverse sets of tasks, such as translation, um, sentence similarity, document summarization, et cetera, et cetera. If we go into deep into the pre-training uh, process, so in this process, T5 learns to fit in, in those dropped out span of text. So instead of just predicting inputting, they are going to like corrupt for in, in, inviting here and put it into X. Then we need to predict that X is going to be for inviting. And then the Y here is last here. So this is how you do this kind of dropped out span of text. Um, this kind of T5 during the um, fine tuning process, you just need to kind of give it a specific questions and then it will give you the specific output. So um, this kind of architecture forced T5 to answer questions based on knowledge that it internalized during the pre-training. That's three different type of pre-training paradigms. So I hope you remember that some of them are great for generation, some of them are great for language understanding and then encoder-decoder allows for both. In addition to this kind of pre-training model architecture, if we view a lot of the uh, models today, they also differ in other dimensions. One of the dimension is data, so which data is used to train the model. Most of the data or most of the models are trained on Wikipedia or book corpus, um, but then you can fine tune those models for more specific domain. Some of the model size differ significantly. So think about a 12 layer, 24 layer, 
76 layer. So all of those matters. And also experimental setting. Something very interesting is called that um, how long you train the model for. Uh, previously, we train those model until we see that the curve uh, converge, and that's the stop, stopping criteria. Roberta did this kind of investigation of continue train the model once it converge. And recently, especially in the RL domain, uh, people found that when the model loss converge, you can actually keep tuning it for 10 times more of what you spent so far. And then something interesting will happen. So there will be a second stage where you see that the loss starts to uh, change as well. And then that's where a lot of the interesting properties may cover. So a very open-ended question. So any caveats for fine-tuning? Well, if we just think about this kind of pre-training fine-tuning paradigms for everything I talk about, fine-tuning is still very expensive and uh, not very efficient because you still need the training data to have or to be available for fine-tuning. And also, uh, there may be this kind of forgetting issue that is the model if you are going to do this kind of uh, fine-tuning, it may forget uh, some knowledge in the original pre-trained model aspects. Before I move into the in-context learning, um, I want to mention that actually even in the age of GPT-2 uh, in 2019, generations are still very bad. So this is one of the 1.5 billion parameter models trained on 40 gigabytes of data. Uh, for GPT-2. As you can see, it looks uh, plausible for the generations, but if you read it carefully, the content is actually not coherent or meaningful or reasonable. Um, apparently, for this kind of models that I mentioned earlier, when you increase the layers, increase the heads, increase the parameters, um, the model performance starts to emerge. So if you just compare GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, uh, you see that the layers increase from 12 to 48 to 96, and then all the cost, et cetera, et cetera. Um, GPT-3, I want to mention is that this is the first time that training large language models receive criticism for the, receive criticize for the environmental impact for the first time. And very interestingly, GPT-3 in the original setup cost $4.6 million um, and also a lot of computing power here. Any questions for the second part? Okay, so um, I want to go back to the, the more fundam fundamental part of your presentation on uh, the Transformer paper. So I just recently started to read this paper and I still don't understand every details in that paper yet. But I've, what I found interesting in your presentation is the, um, the picture where you have the Transformer blocks unrolled. I, I rarely get to see that picture. And I wonder, it makes me wonder why do you need to stack encoders um, in the first place? Um, do, could you explain what the stacking of the encoders and decoders actually do? Um, my, my hypothesis is that, uh, is it the same as the way you stack neural networks into layers? So the, the upper layers maybe uh, look at the, the coarser, uh, coarser grain representation of the input or something like that. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, first, I didn't make those figures myself. I think uh, the stacking of multiple encoders and decoders, that's actually part of the GPT-2 architecture. So that's how they create their like, powerful large language models just by using deeper and deeper network. I think there are a few uh, explanations of why you need that. One of them, as you mentioned, so if, if we want to extract a very higher order feature information about the input, then we may need a more powerful network and more layers to learn what's there. So you basically enable, I guess, like higher order semantic information, 
semantic information extraction. So that's one part of the reason. Uh, second part is that in terms of something you mentioned, um, I think it's unclear what uh, interpretability you have there. Uh, for simpler architectures like BERT, if you think about like a 12 layer BERT, there are interpretability studies showing that, okay, the lower layer capture more like word information. Um, the middle layer captures something like synthetic information, like word order. The top layer captures something more related to the label, such as semantics, et cetera, et cetera. So different layers may capture information to different extent. Those kind of transformer layer interpretation research is still in the earlier stage because there are a lot of like a muddy-headed attention and a lot of kind of uncertainty in the process. It's actually really hard to establish some very transparent interpretability paths of how model do reasoning when there are many, 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 many layers. So I would view it as an open space. But so far, I think the commonly accept um, explanation is that more layer and able you to capture more information in the input. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, there may be a saturated stage where when the layer is already deep enough, maybe you already capture whatever you have in the input. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so I have the question about, uh, it's oh, here, yeah. So oh. I have the question about um, when, when we train M MT5 or like, uh, uh, multitask model, like do we need to implicitly tell the model like which tag uh, it's performing or we just tell them like input and output uh, IDs? Yeah, I think uh, in the MT5, I don't know the much details, but if you look at T5, uh, they include like a machine translation type of task, right? So for those type of tasks, you still give it, you give it the input to output, like a sentence in English, a sentence in French or Thai, but then you also give it a tag like the tag could be E, like E to Spanish or something like that. So you give it a special tag there so that that tag could probably synthesize information from other similar pairs that you have. So for the uh, multilingual version, I suspect that there is going to be such tag available so that you can actually not only just learn the input to output mapping, but also have a way to uh, learn something across different data points. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have two questions uh, interrelatedly. Uh, first is that, uh, and uh, with the I noticed that the uh, difference between GPT two and three GPT three is uh, on the data side is very large. Uh, um, and uh, from what I know, uh, from what I know, uh, second handedly, that uh, the the data itself is not really just a corpus of text anymore. It's, it's, it may include the code and other yes. kind of things as well. So uh, for the last language model to, uh, to train, do you need to structure all the da uh, data, and corp uh, data and corpus into the input itself? And how would you structure that when you train with uh, multiple tasks? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not from the NLP task by itself, so uh, I'm, uh, my second bit of the question is that uh, if you have to evaluate on multiple tasks, how do you structure the network in order to do that? Yeah, so um, first uh, we are going to cover more about uh, like training of those and the more uh, like advanced architecture and uh, techniques like instruction, fine tuning, code, like utilizing code to scale it up and also RLHF in the next part. But so far, uh, we talk about like pre-training and fine tuning as one of the main paradigm. I guess one thing you mentioned is the data. So data is very important uh, for sure. So far for a lot of those like open AI models, we actually don't know the training corpus. So there may be a lot of data very important that we don't know. So uh, that's one thing. And then the, what's your second question? Your second question is task, okay. Yeah, so, so far we do not take care of like many, many different tasks, et cetera. We are going to just train the same model utilizing la uh, language modeling as the underlying mechanism. And surprisingly, uh, once you have a great language modeling, uh, all the downstream performance are going to increase to some extent. That's why this kind of single architecture is so powerful and have a lot of 
I guess, attention and the popularity these days. So you do not need to see like, oh, I'm building symptom analysis when a colleague is building limited anti recognition and my, my boss is building machine translation. So we need a three systems. Now like it's all sh shared in terms of infrastructure and then you can still do evaluations. So I'm going to move to the second part and it will have more recent techniques in terms of instruction fine tuning and IHF, which then will close the gap for what do we mean by ChatGPT and the GPT-4. So, so far I mainly talk about pre-training and the fine tuning, like uh, so we are still in the middle yet. Okay, so um, in context learning. So as you probably see that the uh, table I shared or the figure, GPT-3 has a lot of parameters, like 175 billion parameters. You cannot sort of fine tune this type of models in 2020. Not many places in the world has resources to do the fine tuning due to its very large size. As a result, a prompt or in-context learning was introduced to help the research community. Uh, so basically what the prompting does is that you are going to encourage the pre-trained model to make particular predictions by providing a query or a prompt specifying the task to be done. So what does that mean? Um, okay, so Let's say, if I want to do a sentiment analysis, um, instead of building a sentiment classifier, we are going to get the sentence and then just ask, overall, it was a blank movie. Um, or if you think about the word knowledge, a lot of the task that I mentioned earlier, sorry, the animation is not working here. Uh, so pre-training actually will learn different type of um, information. And then this knowledge is useful across NLP tasks for many, many of those. That's why like large language modeling is very powerful. And then those knowledge can be surfaced or triggered through prompt. So if we want to solve like a sentiment analysis classifier here, so instead of building a model, we can just input the tweet, I love the new Batman movie, and then sentiment leave it blank. And then model is going to replace it with positive. Or if you think about question answering, it says, um, I am a ML or AI language model tutoring. And the user says, what is a language model? And then the chatbot may tell you, a language model is a statistical model that describes the probability of a word giving previous words. So um, this is a targeted word knowledge, or sometimes we call it a priming or prompting. If you think about summarization, this seems very challenging. Previously, we built a giant system to do summarization. Now you can simply ask a TLDR, and then it will give you a very concise summary of the content there. So this is one model, n task. So no need to build a separate models. You can just use prompting to query this type of models. Even for translation or natural language to code, you can just see something like write a SQL request to find all users who live in California and uh, have over 1,000 credits. And then it will give you this kind of SQL command. So all the um, orange part are generated through prompting from models like GPT-3 here. So um, this leads to some sort of um, I guess terminologies or something people always say. So you can call this kind of fine tuning objective engineering and then this kind of prompting, prompt engineering. Uh, there is also a joke that there may be job positions available for prompt engineers. So on the left side, so this is like fine tuning um, that I mentioned earlier, like you can fine tune a model like BERT. So basically what you are going to do is that uh, you have this kind of pre-trained models and then you have input text. Um, we could uh, fine tune the model on some uh, available data set. So here you still required to be around 10,000 data instance. Um, this process may involve catastrophic forgetting, not in the way of how continual learning is still with or struggle with catastrophic forgetting, but more in terms of when we fine tune to in a specific task, it forget or it didn't remember a lot of the things learned in the pre-training stage. Uh, you probably also hear this kind of like 
prefix tuning or prompt tuning or a lot of those, we call it, we categorize all of those as prompt engineering here. So in this scenario, we're going to fro like froze the model. We are not going to make any changes to the pre-trained model. We just use it as what it is. And then we are going to use prompt to trigger all the things that we are going to say. Um, a lot of the usage here may also involve models like adapters, prefix, LoRa, a lot of those like lightweight to the fine tuning actually also come from this space. So this is actually a very interesting stage to think about how to triggering the empower, impressive power from large language models with limited supervision, limited data, and limited training um, resources. So that's about like prompting. And then what's interesting is that researchers found that when we have models as big as GPT-3, you can actually have this phenomenon called zero-shot learning or emerging capabilities. You can get or beat a state-of-the-art on language modeling benchmark with no task-specific fine-tuning. That is, we do not need to do fine-tuning. Some of the prompting and the zero-shot learning can actually give us state-of-the-art performance on many, many data sets. And this kind of emerging capabilities of large language models actually uh, emerge, um, I think, for the first time in GPT-3 type of models. Um, usually you see this kind of emerging capabilities uh, when the model size is big and when the training data is big. This kind of emerging few shot learning capabilities um, compared to zero shot. Zero shot is that you just ask it directly what is the label. In a few shot setting, you give it a few examples. So you demonstrate what you want and then ask the model to follow those examples and do something similar. So we also call all of those in-context learning. So the goal here is that we do not need to do any gradient updates anymore. And then we are just going to write a natural language prompt when learning on a new task. So this emerging few shot learning capabilities, um, you can do it in this kind of zero shot fashion. You can write one examples, like if you want to translate English to French, you first give it one sentence as, or one data point as a demonstration. And then you can ask it, okay, what is cheese uh, in French? You can also do it for few shot fashions. So not only just give it a sea otter peppermint here, you can give it a three and then ask it to do translation for your example. This kind of prompting works very well. Um, this is one example where, um, let's say someone wanted to ask a GPT-3, like my company produce reusable water bottles that can be refilled from the tap. Please brainstorm solutions to increase sales at your store. So the right uh, text are the prompt we give. And then you can see that the GPT-3 actually produced something very meaningful. It says, offer a discount to customers who purchase your reusable water bottles. Place your bottle, water bottles in high traffic areas of your store. Educate your staff about the benefits. Uh, make sure that your bottle wa water bottles are easy to find and accessible in your store so that the customers can easily grab one when they need it. So very plausible generation. Uh, prompting for large language models, um, actually, if you do it well, you do not need any additional training. And uh, you can have very amazing applications. So for example, in 2020, um, one of the new article uh, producers actually write an article about AI being harmless to human beings. In 2021, people use it to generate text-based adventure games. Uh, in 2022, uh, you can actually use it to screen for earlier signs of disease. Um, recently, I think there are also examples of utilizing large language models to do game uh, generation directly. However, uh, GB3, so we are still at GP3. GP3 lack the capabilities of reasoning. So if you ask which is heavier, a toaster or a pencil, um, the answer is a pencil is heavier than a toaster, which is wrong. If you ask how many eyes does my photo have, 
it tells you your foot have two eyes, which is impossible, and thus there is an alien creature um, you are. Um, so as we can see that those models actually don't have capabilities of reasoning, even if you design your prompt to be better or creative, they still perform worse than task specific fine-tuned models for smaller sizes. There is a huge gap towards human cognitive level deep semantic understanding. Then there are something um, happened. So because everyone was doing prompting and uh, researchers found that some tasks seem too hard for even large language models to learn through prompting alone, especially for tasks that are re uh, evolve richer multiple step of reasoning. The thing here is that the human also struggle with those tasks. So we are going to approach human level capabilities for many of those, but how? Well, one thing is that if you think about how we do math, uh, if you have a problem, you need to solve it. So in our high school or middle school, we were taught to write down everything step by step. So is it possible that we can also teach those models instead of jumping from question to answer immediately, is there a way that we can teach them on how to solve the problem, lay out the process of solving versus only the correct answers? So this is what we call chain of thought prompting released by Google. So on the left, you can have a standard prompting where you give a question, you have an answer, and then you give another question, you want an answer, but then the answer is wrong. So in chain of thought prompting, what we are going to do is that instead of asking or demo, like providing examples of question and answer, we are going to tell the model, like, hey, this is a question, but in order to get the answer, we need to think about how to get it. Because right now, Roger uh, started with five balls, two cans of three tennis balls, each is six tennis balls, five plus six equals 11. So the answer is 11. So we give it this process of reasoning. And apparently we found that models start to pick up this kind of step-by-step -step reasoning. So you see that in order to produce an answer for nine, it actually laid down the process of how nine is calculated. So this is this kind of like reasoning guarantee. Uh, researchers found that the chain of thought prompting is a emerging property of model size. Um, not only you can do this kind of uh, chain of thought prompting in a one shot or few shot version, can we just ask the model to reason through things in a zero shot fashion? Well, it turns out that you can actually do this kind of zero shot chain of thought prompting. Uh, you can just ask, a jungler can judge 16 balls, half of the balls are golf balls, balls and half of the golf balls are blue. Then how many blue golf balls are there? So instead of asking it for an answer, we will just see, let's think step by step. And then the model are going to output like, there are 16 balls in total. Half of those are golf balls. This means that there are eight golf balls. Half of the golf balls are blue. This means that there are, full, uh, there are four blue golf balls, which is correct. So zero shot chain of prompting actually has very uh, impressive performance. So as you can see from this table on like a math reasoning and some of the other reasoning tasks, um, just ask the model directly can actually achieve something like 78.7, .7, which is comparable to you doing like a few shots or a lot of the other type of fine tuning here. So chain of thought largely improve many, many uh, model performance. One thing is that sometimes those chain of thought or step by step re reasoning may also lead to wrong performance. So Later, there is this kind of new technique called self-consistency. Instead of asking the model to only generate step-by-step step once, we are going to ask it multiple times. And then we are going to do a majority voting to see, okay, um, since there are three step-by-step -step plans of coming to the final answer, if the majority of them give me answer one, and others give me other answers, then maybe I'm going to take the majority vote here. 
So this is called a self-consistency uh, trick, and it further improved reasoning. Okay, so we talk about uh, pre-training fine-tuning, and instruction fine-tuning is another way of pushing the capabilities of GPT-3 into something further. So in this kind of uh, instruction fine-tuning, we are basically going to collect examples of instruction and output pairs across many tasks and then fine-tune those kind of models. So this is implemented in some of the text DaVinci 001, 002, and the significantly improved zero-shot learning capabilities. There are also the process of leveraging code generation into this process. So as you can probably imagine from those OpenAI models, there are the like code version of those uh, DaVinci um, series variations. Uh, there are also limitations of instruction fine tuning. So one of the uh, instruction fine tuning is still that very expensive to collect ground truth data for task. There are also a lot of other limitations. For example, if you think about open ended creative text generation, we actually don't have right answer. Or um, if you think about instruction fine tuning, there is actually a mismatch between large language model objectives and then the objective of satisfying human preference. So with that, we are going to go into RLHF and the how ChatGPT and the GPT-4 are trained. I think we can take a 10 to 15 minutes break here and then come back for the RLHF because there will be some math involved. Um, I'll be here in case you have any questions.